<laughs> and I might add that it's the first time that I've ever spoken on this topic, so good luck to all of us. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming. Thank you to the Archbishop for having me, uh, for David Kerr for organizing my life, and uh, to Rosalind and others who have driven me and to the uh, Cathedral House that has hosted me. It's a very cheerful and lovely place to stay, so thank you very much for your welcome. Um, I hope you can understand my badly, I, I'm 10 days past a cold, also, I do have a Philadelphia accent. Um, our English is a lot less lovely than yours here. You, your accent, by the way, is adored in the United States. Um, I have a little bit of a Philly accent. We call it a Philly girl twang. My mother hated it, but I still have it. So um, I, I hope I can be clearly understood. Uh, so again, thank you so much. I, um, I approach this topic with a little trepidation because it is the first time I have written on it. My specialties are assisting the church in the church and in the world, especially on the questions of women, the family, and the relationship between church and state. So to actually focus on the role of the laity, I've just been too busy doing it uh, versus um, thinking on it. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, you know, I have come a great distance from where I live in Washington, D.C., acutely aware that this topic is, sounds in theology, and I have only enough theology to be dangerous, right? I, I have a master's degree, and then I have three years in a doctoral program, <clears throat> at which point uh, Cardinal Bernadine of Chicago and Cardinal O'Connor of New York asked me with some desperation to assist the U.S. bishops in a public dialogue about very neuralgic issues at the time, the abortion issue in the United States. So because I am not a theologian uh, of, of any uh, real training, I know I could not have been asked here as a theologian, and there would have been many people who would love to have come to Scotland at any time for any reason to speak on this who are theologians. So I imagine that I've rather been asked to share what I have learned over more than 30 years of working with and for and sometimes in church structures and working with clergy, with the laity, and even in the public square. And I've been at a state university. I mean, I am paid by the state of Virginia uh, to be a professor, but at the same time, I am a publicly identified Catholic. It's hard for me to go anywhere. Uh, when I go on the, the national, the congressional news service C-SPAN, uh, you know, I give them my resume as a law professor, but they know me from public appearances as a Catholic. And I have to be sure that I'm identified when I'm there as a law professor to speak on the law because they always want to say, well, everything she says take through the prism of being a Catholic. So I'm very publicly identified. So I'm going to try and put at your service today my thoughts on this 30 years of service to avoid observations which would be too specific to my own experience or country. But I will tell you that it would be impossible for me to escape my, my formation, uh, which is as the child of two devout Catholic parents, one from Cuba, one a fourth generation Irish. Uh, my mother's family comes from the Dublin area way back in the late 19th century. My father born and raised in Cuba. Uh, they had a true love for the church and it was my second home as a child. I felt as free in the church as I did in my living room, yes. And, and priests and sisters uh, were at our house for, for active conversation. My father was in the defense industry um, and we had a lot of pacifist priest friends who would come to argue at the dinner table with my father. So it was a lovely uh, a home environment. I'm also formed as an adult from a country and a town, Washington DC, and a profession, Pache, Rosalind, lawyering, that is full of pretensions and conclusions about what really matters and what works in the world. So as I lived and grew in this environment, I came more and more as an adult, and I, I, I went into studying Catholic theology in my mid to late 20s. I was practicing law already. 
I came there because I fell in love with its version of what really matters as compared to all the other isms and, 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 and theories about the world. So that said, my experiences, I was a trial lawyer for a firm that represented not only an archdiocese, but also 11 other religious communities in Philadelphia. Then I was a lawyer internal to the Catholic bishops. Then I was the public face of all the US bishops in television and radio and to all the political parties and to the government. Then I was a professor at the Pontifical University in the US. Then I remain an advisor to dioceses, to the national bishops, and sometimes to the Holy See. And now I am a scholar of religious freedom and of marriage and family and sex who begins with a Catholic anthropology. So all that is to say that my background as a layperson has also been very enmeshed in church structures and thinking. These experiences at the same time move me to constructively criticize how the church operates in the world today, respecting the role of the laity. So what I want to offer you this morning toward the overall goal of highlighting the positive mission of the laity in the church and in the world with specific uh, uh, reference to elements of our contemporary mission in response to the signs of the times. What I want to offer you there is as follows, and I wouldn't be a law professor if I didn't give you an outline and stick to it, so that's what I'll do. First, I want to reflect, reflect briefly on the church's movement from really a more negative definition of the, the laity's role and, and identity to what the Archbishop has referred to in Lumen Gentium and Vatican II as a very positive articulation of that mission. Second, I'm going to be dealing at the most length with the signs of the times that appear to be shaping the demand for our lay expertise to assist and to promote the faith in the world, to describe the dire needs of the clergy, of church structures, and the dire need of the world for the lay vocation. Then I'll talk about the necessary preparation of the laity to meet this demand, and then just a few words in conclusion. So turning to my first topic, the development of Catholic teaching on the laity. I think it can be accurately, if very briefly, said that especially Vatican II, with its document Lumen Gentium, and in Paul VI's decree on the role of the laity, and later in John Paul II's exhortation, Christa Fidelis Laici, that the church moved away from the idea that the laity's main role, its main thing, was to respond to very specific requests made by the clergy for discrete tasks. And it moved toward the idea that God invites, Christ invites, the Holy Spirit invites us, individually and as groups, to come to work in God's vineyard, which is the world. The church today, therefore, speaks of our being commissioned, if you will, by the sacraments, particularly by baptism, also by confirmation, and for those of us who have been married by the sacrament of matrimony, to engage in the affairs of the world in particular, and to work to order them, not just in you know, results, but in structure and in function, according to the plan of God. And the plan of God where God doesn't just save humanity, but also works in the temporal order. I think one of the biggest mistakes we make is, you know, church and world, or God and, and world. God did not become incarnate because he hated the world, or because he didn't think that the things of the world could be used in a way that was holy or beautiful or drawing us to Christ. So in other words, God wants worldly affairs to come into being and to be more conformed to his gospel. And this is a temporal order that he sanctified, again, not only by creating it, but by becoming incarnate and by, by, by living with and working with human beings in order to sanctify it. This new paradigm of the role of the laity also describes God's work, not only for us to work in the temporal world outside the church, but also for our work inside the church. Here, in our cooperation with clergy and with religious, neither replacing but rather complementing one another 
we assist one another in the church's cooperative endeavor to actually, and I mean this is a huge charge, to witness to Christ so that when our children see us, they can say, as we hope they would react to the Eucharist, right, or to scriptures, ah, Christ is alive now. Be not afraid. You know, he's among us. This is great. I see that God has not left us alone. He has not left us orphans, right? I love that phrase, right? And that's our mission. We actually have to be witnesses. This transition from the old to new articulation of the role of the laity has also been accompanied by a move from a negative to a positive description from the laity. The old description was, we were neither clergy nor religious, okay? The new description, it hasn't changed the fact that we're not clergy and we're not religious, but we are rather positively identified as those people who by baptism are incorporated in Christ with, as the Catechism says, quote, our own part to play in the mission of the whole Christian people in the church and in the world, okay? Although this means everything, <laughs> the church often highlights specially the realms of politics, the economy, and social life. You see those mentioned again and again in its documents. And they emphasize that the lay duty is the more pressing when we go places that clergy and religious don't go. Okay, and I'll be talking a lot about that. Um, let me first now turn then to the signs of the times that I think are <coughs> the, 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 the clarification, the crystallization of the demands being made on you and me today specifically. Because there are specific signs of every times that we have to respond to in order to make Christ present in the world. So the first, I think, um, before I even say that, a few preliminary words about things we want to avoid in responding to these signs of the times. <clears throat> extremes that we want to avoid in taking up this work. The first would be an extreme separation <clears throat> between clergy, religious, and the laity. Catholic theology stresses our equal holiness and our equal dignity. And while our functions are different, in fact, they, the, the catechism says very particularly, the clergy's function is to be at the service of the laity, right? The Catholic, uh, the catechism in 1547. And speaking, of course, quite practically with regard to avoiding extreme separation, they are our uncles, our brothers, our cousins, our sons, our friends, our classmates, our colleagues. I will likely also say more than once today, clergy and religious need our arms and legs to take Christ to places that they can't and don't go. They also need, and I saw this very particularly in work that I'll tell you about, our love, our friendship, our compassion, right? I, I was in charge of the investigation into clerical sex abuse in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia with the police, with the prison officials, and with victims. And I interviewed lots and lots of clergy. It was my hometown, I knew these guys. And one of the things they would say to me is how since the sex abuse crisis arose, they had lost so many friends. If they went out to dinner with a woman or a nun who was a friend of theirs, who was, who was a religious, then everyone said, father's having an affair. If they went out with a man, they said, father's having a different kind of affair. <laughs> if they hung out with families, with kids, they said, Father's got a thing for kids. They said, we need friends who are our true, our actual friends, who know us with our strengths and our weaknesses, who will call us to be our best selves, who will call us on the carpet when there's a problem. But we need your friendship. And if we don't have it, and if we're too alone, and if we don't actually have you speaking frankly to us, that is not good. And people fall into alcoholism or despair or depression or other problematic you know, behaviors. Clergy and religious also need, however, our intelligent analysis and evaluation of an increasingly complex world, okay, in which our faith, sure, it's on offer, but it's in very stiff competition with a robust secularism, materialism, individualism. They need the understanding that we bring about what's going on in the contemporary world so that the church can be intelligent about everything from its finances to its law to its managing of education and health care and the laity and the sex abuse crisis, right? They need all of that to be brought in by us. Second, we want to avoid an extreme conflating. We want to avoid an extreme separation and an extreme conflating of clergy and laity. 
There is not only a difference in the graces of the sacraments we receive, but there's also a difference in the preparation for our vocations, right? And in the fabric of our work in daily lives. With the laity out there, Good Samaritan-like, attending to the people God has thrown in our path, right? I think of my children as the first people God has strewn in my path, right? With relentless opportunities to do the right thing, right? Uh, mostly, of course, we're meeting the, the needs of our, our friends, our family, the people we meet in business and out in the world, right? The ordained are meeting mostly to the needs of the laypersons entrusted to them as they are also specially ordained and commissioned and empowered representatives of Christ in persona Christi to preach the gospel, to celebrate divine worship, to offer their lives for us in a very, very direct manner, specifically to God for us, and as nowhere more fully captured than in the Eucharist. We also want to avoid, as one of the extremes, clericalism. Clerical clericalism and lay clerical. Clerical clericalism would see the ordained as an active controlling elite in contrast to a servile and passive laity. <clears throat> this could manifest itself in a variety of ways. Clericalism has many faces. A too opulent lifestyle, putting the interests of the brotherhood of clerics or religious ahead of us, the laity. Uh, it might even manifest in clerical attempts to exercise authority over temporal things that really are outside of clerical competency and are really in the direct competency of the laity. Evangelium Gaudium talks about this a lot. I have seen, for example, sometimes uh, some clerics de you know, develop sort of a, an intense interest in politics, and like it could save everything or it could damn everything. And one of the things you really see in uh, commission to the laity is to to bring the sort of thing that politic is, a very temporal thing, its structures, its functions, its messages, its purposes, you know, in line with the gospel of Christ. There's also lay clericalism, which can be hard to distinguish sometimes from the lays giving appropriate respect to the very sacrificial ministry of the clergy and of the religious. But lay clericalism exists. It exists when the laity are more like fans or in awe of priests and bishops and religious than they are actually friends or collaborators, right, with them. Um, I see this in some of the bishops' meetings I attend, where people are watching for bishops to come in almost more as fans, like you would with a celebrity, than co-members of the body of Christ, okay? There's also the laity abdicating its responsibility and leaving it to the clergy. Um, I won't go into detail about this because I don't want to be overly critical of anyone in particular, but I was on the board of a Catholic university that was really not doing a very good job. Um, I was on the board of trustees communicating the full breadth of Catholic teaching. It, it would lurch really far left, then it would lurch really far right, or then it would hire like no Catholics at all. And people who would say, oh, Catholic social teaching is lovely and I totally intend to read it someday. <laughs> and they really had no knowledge at all. And they'd get in there and they were really problematic. At, at the very best, they did no harm to Catholicism, but at the worst, they did a lot of harm. They were all politics or they were all some other ideology. And then I would be on this board of trustees and I would see the priest who was the head of the college telling the various bishops on the board that everything was great, hiring for mission was going great. And the lay people, like, weren't speaking up enough. And, and I was a very young professor. And finally I thought, I'm not getting paid. I'm not going to lose my job. I want to be able to support my kids. I'm high. Hiring for mission really stinks here. <laughs> I'm really sorry. And the bishop and the priest who was running the college is not very happy. Just, but I have seen the laity too deferential. I have also seen lay clericalism when we put things at the, at the U.S. Bishops' Conference, every once in a while, I just want to cringe. There was this one staff that had its, the bishop get up at a meeting, and it was about women and marriage and family and sex. And they had the bishop giving this talk where he got into like intense detail. He was not a doctor, into intense detail about birth control and how it works and how it doesn't and what it was doing to women. And there was a woman sitting next to me who was an OBGYN who taught at Georgetown University Hospital cringing listening to the bishop say things that just were not in his competence and he wasn't getting them exactly right and she thought oh my gosh why are they putting this in the mouth of a bishop this belongs in my mouth 
You know, I have, I have taught OBGYN at a leading hospital. I have, she was the head of the Catholic, the Spanish Catholic Center in DC, had served poor Catholic women for decades. And we were cringing that the bishop was talking OBGYN about, you know, women's, women's health care. And there were these, and she wasn't the only doctor in the audience. Lay clericalism. No, the people at the bishop's staff should have had that woman up on the podium, okay? That's what I mean by that. Turning to my, the, the actual point on the signs of the times, now that I've talked about sort of excesses to avoid, which appear to be shaping the demand for lay expertise, okay? I think that all of these signs which I'm going to share with you evidence one interesting universal point, which is that it's not only God specifically calling each of us to be his witnesses in the world, and it's not only clergy and religious who benefit from our going all the places that we go, but it's also today human beings desperately in need of the witness of Christ that are calling us to put our lay vocation into action. In a world where more and more spheres are closed officially and in principle to religious influence in any kind of official way, we are all there is. We are all there is to bring the light of Christ into those places, okay? Because church as institution, clergy as clergy, religious as religious is not welcome, okay? So let me turn to the first sign of the times. I think, it's, I think you could all have guessed it. It would be just a robust secularism. This can be defined in many ways, but I think it would at least include an indifference to the fact of God, whether he exists or not, what he might be like, whether he's operating in the world or not, a belief that if he does, maybe he's irrelevant to human affairs, we can take care of ourselves. He's irrelevant to the family, to economics, to politics, to social life, to education, the media, etc. It's just, that's our business, not his. Alongside this forgetting of God comes an inability to see myself or others as having any lasting or important meaning other than, you know, sort of taking care of business on planet Earth for as long as we have. We don't have any transcendent vocation. We're not being called because we're made by God or in his image or called to a divine destiny. All of this is missing in a secularist environment. More and more today, powerful institutions studiously ignore God. Just they, they, they have to work for it because a lot of the public doesn't ignore God or it's been a fab part of the fabric of that institution. A lot of the people in the institution believe in God, but the institutions themselves formally have to ignore him. Higher education is a particular place, and lower education as well. Media, government, politics, art, science, economics. They even ignore, because they feel they have to, the rational evidence of God's existence. Or the rational evidence that religious norms are actually really good for people when carried out. They're really part of a full-bodied human happiness. They're an important linchpin of actually achieving equality and freedom in a society, okay? Um, there was a study out of Harvard University in the United States that got a great deal of attention last week, great deal of coverage, that said that young people formed religiously, really religiously formed, uh, and this was measured in good ways. And this was controlling for, so it wasn't related to race or family income or level of education. It was, they tried to isolate the influence of religion. <coughs> were happier. They were happier. They were less depressed. They were less likely, you know in the US we have a huge opioid addiction problem. They were less likely to turn to opioid addiction. They were less likely to have very early sexual debut. They were less likely to engage in bullying. They were more likely to have a positive view of society and their place in it. You know, the law can do so much. Education at school, like the idea that if we say it in school, they'll do it. Right, I can, and I say that even teaching graduate school, can only do so much. It has to be a conversion of heart, a worldview, and that young people really formed in this were actually demonstrating the kind of happiness and freedom and kindness and so forth that we hope for. But there's an even ignoring of this, an ignoring of the idea that human beings are going to seek an ultimate meaning and end of things. 
And if they don't find it in God, if we say that's irrelevant, well, they're going to find it in money, or they're going to find it in career success, or they're going to find it in power, right? The idea that you can squelch a search for ultimate meaning and not even mention rationally that this is a part of the human person has very much taken over the leading secular institutions. At most, religious belief might be respected as one aspect of a person's subjective self-identity. Okay, you can subjectively believe that about yourself, just like you're allowed to be subjective about every other thing. No, that's really who I am. That's cool. Just don't do it in groups, and don't ask for any religious freedom to show it in public. Okay? A second sign of the times is related to the first. Given humanity's relentless search for meaning, an insistent uh, secularism leads people to other idols. And I think today two of the biggest are materialism and the exaltation of personal free choice. Uh, even against the idea of any givens at all, even our own body. One aspect is, of this latter is the exaltation of what I call in my scholarship um, sexual expressionism. This is the exaltation of just any sexual act as crucial to a person's identity, but actually, in particular, sexual acts divorced from even the idea that this is where God or nature put procreation, and divorced from anything having to do with the relationship. Sex is exalted as an individual good. It's because I choose this or that act that it's good. Divorced from relationship. Divorced from anything having to do with tomorrow. You know, you might not even get a text, <laughs> let alone a date, a relationship, marriage, kin, family, or, or love, or even remembering your name. I mean, that's, in the United States, the measures of, of um, college uh, sexual experience, one out of every three is before they've had a date. It's the day they met, okay? And like two out of every three is like the day or after they met. It's, it's completely divorced from relationship and tomorrow. I mean, the, the logical conclusion of that is what we have now, sex, robots, and pornography, right? Pornography is the largest use of the internet. It's divorced from human relationship or tomorrow. Materialism is also an idol in our secularized culture. If you think about it, materialism says material things are more real and more important than God. But of course, it's a risky strategy, materialism, right? It's like the red shoes in the Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. It will take you places you may not wish to go, right? It can determine where you work, how you live, how you spend your days, what your priorities are. It can distance you from people, especially the poorest, right? Especially them. A third sign of the times. Once human beings distance themselves from the notion of a creator God who makes us diverse, but radically equal and in his image. Once we valorize material things above all, once we divorce sex from the well-being of anybody else and from tomorrow, we begin to deny the dignity of other human lives. Materialism, sexual expressionism, no God, nobody made in his image. It's a very short distance to violating the rights of other human beings to life, to calling killing caring when we do it to people at the most vulnerable stages of their life, elderly, disabled, unborn. Thus our failures also to give sustained and effective attention to the people who lack even the basic necessities for the dignified life that God gave them, right? I mean, I don't know about your politics. I didn't have time to study up enough of them and I wouldn't comment on them even if I had. <laughs> uh, but in the US, I can say with certainty that no political party gives sustained attention to the poor. It's all about what the middle class wants, and then it's all about what the wealthy want as well. But th the truly poor, not really. A fourth factor conditioning the role of the laity might broadly be called the rise of distraction and the related decline of cultivated, concerned, meaningful human interaction. This is closely related to the rising sophistication of these personal communications devices and our tendency to conflate progress with technology. So the, I mean, I know that my kids have grown up, we live four blocks from an Apple store in my house, right? It's like Mecca for kids, right? And I know that my own children, I've had to have this conversation a lot, you know, humanity is making progress when the iPhone gets a little thinner. You know, sort of like, really? 
Like, how was that progress? Ah, oh, it's really cool, and it could do so much more. I mean, my son explaining the difference between, you know, I kept a flip phone as long as I could. I mean, it, it almost destroyed my reputation in his eyes because progress is technology versus that beautiful part of Space Alvi, Benedict's um, encyclical, Hope Saves, that progress is actually when we learn to love people more and when we demonstrate that. A fifth factor conditioning the role of the laity is the distrust of the clergy because of the explosive scandal of sex abuse. This means realistically, and who knows for how long, including the blameless and exemplary clergy and religious, all of them will likely have some diminished power to attract people to Christ. It also means in particular that, ironically, one of the last voices, this is true in my society, speaking up for the meaning of sex, for the rights of children, for the personal dignity of women in relationships, and for the meaning of marriage, has been completely compromised regarding their ability to speak on these topics because of the hypocrisy that has become known in the media. <laughs> A sixth factor important to the role of the laity today is the rising presence of women in every sector of society. A, a, a movement praised especially by John Paul II, who said it was their right. But if you read carefully, it's even more interesting. Benedict said it was absolutely necessary for society. I love that transition. I love going from a right to be there to Benedict says, oh my goodness, you have to be there in every sector of society, in his document on the collaboration of men and women. Both the lay, both, lay women are both more and more able to assist the church within and in the world. And it also means that the world, both men and women, will be looking to the church to see whether in its institutional structures and its teachings is reflecting women's dignity and equality and relying in both venues on what women can do because they've demonstrated that they can do it. So what, excuse me, <coughs> what do all of these signs of the times mean for the particular vocation of the laity today, in addition always to our grand vocation to bring Christ to the world. Let me address them. Uh, and again, one could write a book about this, so excuse my really fat, broad brush here. <laughs> Regarding secularism, it points purely and simply to the need for more and more informed work by the laity in more places. Places where religious and clergy are not welcomed in fact or in principle. This means, as it always has, that the laity need to be visibly witnessing to Christ. But I have to say, I think our witness needs to be a little more stunning, okay? I don't know how many of you have read that famous Italian novel, The Betrothed, by Alessandro Manzoni. It's one of my favorites. But there's this incredible scene in it where this very saintly cardinal, Barameo, goes to a young uh, priest who has refused to marry this marvelous young couple, just dear, because a bravo, a very strong, violent man, has threatened him that if he does, he will hurt him. And as a result, these young people have to flee. The girl catches the plague. The most amazing characterization. It's apparently a historical account of the plague, second to none. It will break your heart. But anyway, she ends up off in the midst of the plague. He ends up running for his life. And, and when this cardinal catches up with this priest, he says to him, is this what happened? Did you actually give in to power and, and refuse to, to do the right thing? And he says to him, do you realize that the only way to shine the light of Christ in the world today is to be too good to be true? He said, you have to, you have to blow people's mind. I'm not quoting from the Italian here. Now I'm in my American things. <laughs> he says, you have to blow people's mind the same way that Jesus Christ blew the mind of the apostles, basically by their living with him, and they just couldn't believe what they were seeing. Here is a man who can outfox the lawyers, Sadducees, Pharisees, etc., in a second, but he's also humble. Here's a guy who commands nature like it's nothing, and he's completely consumed with the widow who has lost the last male in her family and who will be nothing in society as a result and, 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 and has a heart for her. Who's like that? The answer is nobody. <laughs> and so they say to one another, this must be God. He's mind-blowing. 
This is everything we hope for. Isn't this everything you hope for? And without getting political, when Donald Trump ascended into the White House, I said to myself, wouldn't it be amazing if he took all the poor and blue collar people and said, listen, I have all the money in the world. I don't need anything. And so I'm going to spend my entire four years in office doing justice for the forgotten American. Like, imagine that. And imagine people you know saying, I'm not going to do what you expect me to do. I'm going to blow your mind, and I'm going to do the most merciful, mind-blowing, cheek-turning, cloak-giving-away thing you've ever seen. And this, this is what the role of the laity has to be, because the world needs more stunning example to, to get through to, to, to the, 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 the barriers because of secularism. I also think, and they say this in Christopher Dallas Laici, Pope Benedict has said it also, that we actually have to be ready not only with our witness, but we're going to have to be ready with a few more words, to be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in us. I think we, it can't just be witness. We have to tie it to Christ. So when my own son at a wild art university in New York, where every teacher not only has a name but a pronoun, so he has to call some of the men they and some of the women he and so forth. I mean, in a world like this, how to witness, in a world where my oldest son's best friend from his undergrad is a, is a gay man and he says, I don't really understand the church on this, mom. You can't just have a witness of something beautiful. You also have to explain. So, you know, you have to work on that. You have to, to, to learn, and you actually, there's work to be done. Communications is not a lesser art, I say to Rosalind. <laughs> we know this. It's not just what you know, but it's your ability to communicate it in a way that is first loving while also being truthful. Okay? It's when the woman beside the plane says to me, you know, something like, well, I'm Catholic, but you know, I don't really believe that stuff anymore. And when I say, you know, I really do. And I came to it as, a, as an academic. And I love it first intellectually, and then I also love it spiritually and emotionally. And she goes, oh, like, oh, it's okay. She goes, well, I didn't exactly mean that. What I meant was she thought she just had to say that because that's the common word. But I'd say, oh, you know what? No, no, you can't offend me. You actually can't. I mean, my skin is like, <laughs> go on TV and get yelled at all the time in the United States. And I said, no, 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 you haven't offended me at all. I totally understand. But I have a real affection. And then we have a conversation, okay? Also regarding the laity's response specifically to secularism, it means taking pains to reflect on your own profession, your own milieu, your own sphere of influence, your own discipline, your own know-how. How does it fall short of what Christ wants for your neighborhood, your school, your, your workplace? And what can you do? What can you draw from Catholic social teaching? from Catholic anthropology to move the structures and relationships and content of your sphere toward a gospel life. This is the aspect of the lay vocation I've probably been most devoted to. My most extensive work has been attempting to take our anthropology, and I don't always reveal where I'm getting it, because I am trying to propose it to the world. So for instance, I did a critique in the US We've been handing out like $2.5 billion a year of contraception to poor mothers since the 70s. And in that same time, their rate of out of wedlock pregnancy, their rate of abortion, their rate of divorce, their rate of cohabitation, their rate of non-marriage, their rate of it has gone skyrocketing. Okay, they've had, everything has worsened. Everything has worsened. Janet Yellen, our Federal Reserve Chairman, has sort of written about why this would be so. But this, it's an interesting article, but it, it's just the case. And it turns, so I went and I did a, a one and a half year examination of all the qualitative and quantitative data. So in addition to birth control, you know, we're giving them education about how to be self-sufficient. And don't worry, we're going to get you out of this neighborhood and we're going to get you into university and we're going to get you a job. We're going to get you away from here. And then it turns out, if you actually go and you read the sociologists who have lived with poor women for years, and you look at what poor women themselves are saying, and you look at the data, they say, hmm, I want to be a giver to somebody. I want to be a gifted giver. I want a baby, because I could give. Nobody thought I was a gift, but I'm going to be a gift to somebody. Okay? And they say, I know this man won't stay with me, but that's okay, because I'm going to have a baby, and I will be able to live my whole vocation 
as that. And what I really want is to be empowered to be a giver. So the only social program that worked in the United States was giving these women extraordinary amounts of social service and work to do where it was shown that they could serve somebody else because of the gifts they had. That lowered the pregnancy rate. That increased their rate of finishing school. So I took all of this qualitative and quantitative data and said, people don't want to be self-sufficient monads. They want to be givers. How do we empower people? Yes, to be smart. Yes, to finish school. You know, put off sexual debut as part and parcel of this whole plan so that you can be a giver and we're going to show you how. Not, don't worry, we're going to get you out of this neighborhood so you're away from your friends, you're away from your parents, you're away from everybody you know, and you're just going to make money and have a cool job. Well, how does that make me a gifted giver? And I take that anthropology that we have, which is the human person is a gifted giver, and I analyze and critique government programs. And then maybe at the end of an article I'll say, oh, you know, John Paul II had a cool insight on this. <laughs> or maybe I won't say that. Okay? I've also had the good fortune of seeing other means by which lay people advance gospel values in the world. I'm on the board of Catholic Relief Services. And I mean, they need the lawyers, the financiers, the supply chain specialists. They need all of it. Someone has to figure out how to get shipping into Yemen and how to properly label the mosquito nets that we're distributing in Africa, right? And it's marvelous. I'm on the board there. And the number of high-level financial and, and legal experts who provide their services in that very specific way to the, the, what is the Catholic bishop's charity to the world is amazing. Turning to the lay response to the signs of the times where sexual expressionism is a phenomenon, and clergy in particular have lost their respected voice on that. Let me preface my thoughts by saying it is really absolutely stunning that one of the last institutions speaking about this has had its credibility so undercut, okay? And I have to say that seeing the shape of this problem in the world and the size of it helped for me answer the question why I had thought, and I know this sounds like a pretty tough criticism, but why the clergy and the bishops' conference, et cetera, in the United States have done such a poor job articulating a, a sexual ethic for the 21st century in a way that bridges, especially to young people's desire for equality, for justice, for truth, for beauty, for, for, for relationships. And, and it also explained to me a lot about why they hadn't involved women in it. This, this, is, this covering for one another in seminaries and dioceses has it's just, it leaves no time and no vision to actually be speaking about this. I just haven't seen that talent. And, and now the, the, the crisis and the size of it, and particularly the shape of it, explained to me why more women hadn't been brought in and why they hadn't been able to do such a great job of it. And I'm hoping we can, now is the time, to get past that, okay? And of course, the laity are especially knowledgeable and experienced when it comes to talking about the joys and the sorrows of sex, marriage, parenting. We are both the victims and the perpetrators of the new sexual marketplace. We are the parents and the friends trying to help forge a better path forward for people from a marketplace where sex is cheap, where sex never says tomorrow, right? In order to set our children and our friends on the right path. And I can't tell you how many lay-led efforts in the United States to put together curriculum or meetings or discussions of these have been all begun by lay people. We have a program called Rua Woods for young people. We have Canavox, where married people and single people get together to discuss this. <coughs> Interestingly, in the US, I think that the uh, document Humani Vitae was completely kept alive by Catholic women. And isn't that ironic? I mean, it really is, if you think about it. It was Catholic women who were the worst victims of the sexual marketplace, who live in a world where in order to get a date, let alone a relationship, you, you really have to have sex. Where a lot of Catholic women I'll talk to say that even most of the men they're dating will say, what do you mean? You know, we've been dating for three months. What do you mean that we're not gonna be sexual? Right? And the women understand 
the question of how this leads to the objectification of women, how taking the weight out of sex has led to a, a, a dating and marriage marketplace where people are cohabiting, people expect sex on the first or second date, marriage is pushed way, way off, and it is the women who kept humanity vitae alive. It was the lay women. It was not the clergy in the United States. It was never top down. It was women up. It's fascinating when I now look back on that after decades of observing. Regarding the other signs of the times, materialism, the violation of human dignity, and the attenuation of human relationships, often in favor of a distracted consumption and entertainment, how do these condition the role of the laity today? Well, I obviously, again, could write a book about each, but I think it's a fair summary to say that the laity are both the purveyors and consumers of the lion's share of these problems. We're the business people, we're the thought leaders, we're the lawmakers promoting impoverished or even appalling values and practices. But the laity are also the ones who should lead efforts to reverse this. In the US and in many countries around the world, I see lay people doing so. I see women who have you know, just totally led the pro-life movement in the United States. I see medical professionals, lay people all over the world taking on the question of euthanasia. I see local groups, lay people, on their own and joining with the enormous charitable efforts of the church um, in its structures, led by clergy and bishops, taking on questions regarding poverty, okay? There's a beautiful marriage of lay and clergy and religious in the United States. Um, Sister Helen Prejean, who you may have heard of, and those she works with working against capital punishment. The Capital Punishment Office of the Catholic Church, in, it's near where my husband works, is all, it's all lay women. And then there's Sister Helen Prejean, who single-handedly brought the issue back alive, and they collaborate beautifully. The laity is also positioned to influence their children, their friends, their co-workers. In a society where the powers that be made it nearly unthinkable to be cheerfully pro-life, let alone to even say, eh, I'm not really sure about the social effects of contraception, right? It's still true that a word to a family member, to a colleague, to a friend can go a long way. I have a Jewish accountant, her name is Deborah Moses, and she's wonderful, dear. And she said to me at one point, she goes, listen, I know what you do. And she goes, I totally get that your church on abortion. She goes, but contraception, I don't get it at all. And I said, you know what? I totally get that you don't get it. Most people don't get it. I said, you want to know what we're thinking? And I took her through what I think is a 21st century view of it. I used the Law and Econ by Janet Yellen, our Fed chairwoman under Obama, about how, listen, on an individual level, it can work to prevent a pregnancy. On a social level, it, it hasn't. It's changed the marketplace of relationships. It just has. And, and at the end of it, she just said, huh, she goes, more to think about than I thought. And I thought, that's all we needed. And she loves my work that she perceives as coming from left politics on the rights of children and immigrants. So she's more, you know, because I'm sort of straight down Catholic social justice, she's more likely to go, hmm, I see what you're thinking. Like she's accepting. So a word goes such a long way. But obviously, have the laity have a long way to go, and more than a few temptations along the way on these neuralgic issues to put us off track. It's easy for laity to believe the entire solution is in government, politics, or economics. And it's very easy to forget about spending quiet time with God to figure out what he's asking us to do. It's also easy for us to forget that your primary audience is Christ. And it's very easy to begin thinking that your primary audience is the powers that be in your field. It's what my dean thinks, it's what my academic colleagues think. We forget about our ultimate mission when we enter into certain spheres. And it's even easy to see how many religious institutions lose their way and become what Francis called, what Pope Francis called, just another NGO. Right? without really understanding that we have to be motivated in the end by bringing the gospel of Christ in word, in deed, in structure. Regarding the role of the laity and women's participation, we can see church documents going back a long way, calling for the active presence of women. Lumen Gentium at Vatican II and other documents there. Pope John Paul II and Benedict explicit statements about that. And indeed, clergy and religious, religious obviously been... Uh, 
being both men and women, are not separated in so many aspects of their lives from, from lay women. You can see a great deal of collaboration from going on. In the US, and I mentioned this yesterday, women are especially prominent as chancellors of dioceses, as directors of uh, finance, as directors of communication, um, and as directors of education and healthcare. In the US, healthcare and education is female. <laughs> We have, we have trouble getting guys in there. I mean, it's, it's so female-led. In fact, there was a great comparison of US corporations versus the Catholic Church, and we beat them so hands down when it comes to women at, 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 at high level, especially chancellors and, and finance. But because of the brotherhood of priests and bishops, because of the processes of seminary formation and clerical life, where you must have close friends, you must have people you can trust, you must have people who know where you're coming from. You know, it's us talking to our friends. It's me talking to other mothers and telling what I really think sometimes about my two-year-old behavior, right? You know, you need people who understand you. But it can be too easy in the clerical life to lose touch with and fail to collaborate with women. And there's moral hazards of all male environments, the most dramatic evidence of which, I believe, of course, is the sex abuse crisis. And I can relate from my own long experience of the risk of clerical not working often enough with women. Sometimes it depends. I am brought in and I am truly engaged and collaborated with. Sometimes there's tokenism. I'm brought in to speak at this or that, give me a paper, where in reality my expertise is not actually incorporated into the world. I can relate, however, from my own long experience, particularly my work with Cardinal John O'Connor uh, in New York, that uh, Archbishop Chaput in Philly, absolute collaboration. Archbishop Chaput will bring me in front of his entire staff and we will argue publicly about something so that they can hear both sides. It's the, I have seen true collaboration and I have seen tokenism. To conclude this point about the signs of the times, I think you can see what a vast vineyard the laity are called to work in. I think this is a function of the positive roles and vision for the laity, especially since Vatican II. And David, I think I have like eight or nine more minutes. I know I'm going a little long, but I hope I don't throw you too far off. I want to also talk then about the substantial preparation we need for this to help the laity rise to the occasion and to form clergy and religious who can empower us to assume our roles. If you take a look at very high church documents on this subject, Centesi Mazanis or Christi Fidelis Leici, you will be overwhelmed and, and give up about what they say is required for the laity. A serious preparation, very devout, regular spiritual and intellectual preparation, receipt of the sacraments uh, very regularly, a life consciously and daily lived in light of God, regular prayer, regular reception of the Eucharist, reading of and reflection upon the scriptures daily, and not only knowing what the church teaches, but why, and very prompt attention on a daily basis to the Holy Spirit. This is ideal. <laughs> this would also provide the layperson not only marvelous wisdom, but also credibility. And, and on the other hand, who is going to listen to people who don't know anything, right? I mean, we know that our clergy and religious have this enormous formation and this direct dedication to the first spouse in their life, Christ, right? I remember being at, getting my hair cut and um, my hairdresser, who's been a friend for a long time, tells this person next to me that um, I'm going to, uh, the mass where Pope Benedict is going to be elevated, uh, rat singer to, to Pope Benedict, and someone says to me, oh, I'm really sorry about that. He really stinks on women. I just, <laughs> said, really? I said, you know, this is not very, let me just get it on the table. This is not very nice of me. Please do not do this. But I'm illustrating a point, but I wouldn't repeat my method. Um, and I said, huh. I said, you know, I really do not know many people who have read everything that Cardinal Ratzinger has written about women. But, but you have, right? <laughs> No. Oh, well, did you read those great interviews one-on-one -on -one with Peter Sievald then, where he really talks about this in a very frank way? And who's Peter Sievald? No, no. And I was like, you know, maybe you're going to want to look at that, because actually he's, he's got some lovely things to say. And um, my work at the Pontifical Council for the Laity when Pope Benedict was Pope was actually, I thought, some of the best work they did on women. So um, it's good to know what you're doing for credibility. It's more likely, however, that lay people are going to fall somewhere in the middle of a continuum 
between this ideal preparation and my experience at my hairdressers. They will benefit a great deal from education and inspiration at the parish and also at home or in Catholic school. And, and I find today, I don't know what your situation is, education at the parish level is more and more forthcoming. You know, adult education, special speakers, lots of scripture studies. Um, one thing that's hit or miss is homilies where our life outside the church is taken seriously. And they are not do good and avoid evil or telling us not to gossip about our in-laws or to be nice to our coworkers. But they're really grappling with the existential angst we're all dealing with when we walk out the front door. Okay? And, and we need that. That is a crucial opportunity. But even with a lot of information and relevant observation and insights, this won't guarantee we're prepared to meet today's world. And I, I think I've already indicated I'm exhibit A. I mean, I, I went to Catholic schools. Then I, in my late 20s, sort of like career crisis, is this all there is? I want to do more for the church. So I go back from my big law firm and I start studying theology. I went five more years in graduate theology. But when I'm faced with children with the dilemmas that I described to you earlier, I'm still saying, how do I give a reason for the hope that is in me to this 16-year-old or this 19-year-old? How am I a more stunning witness to Christ, right? So I need clergy whose first and foremost relationship is with God to, to take everything they've got and help me explain this better. I need them to remind me regularly and with serious purpose that it's my job to be too good to be true, to make Christ visible in my life, okay? I need clergy to help me understand how scripture is a meta-narrative for my life, right? I need them to help me reflect on all of reality in light of God's existence. I need them to hold me and the family and the whole parish to a very high standard. The world insists on an insane amount of preparation for you to be a software engineer or for me to be a lawyer. Why don't we abide by Etienne Gilson's requirement that we need intelligence in the service of Christ. Why aren't they saying it's not enough to just sort of like this stuff or practice? But I need to help you prepare to be as prepared spiritually as anyone expects you to be in what you do in the world. I need also the church in the form of the clergy and religious to help me provide a real community because you're always stronger in community, right? A community to raise our kids, a community to learn about Christ, a community where my kids can see other living examples of the light of Christ. We need liturgies where God's saving action, his presence is visible to us and we can perceive it. If Christ is with us, if we're not supposed to lose hope that he's here, the Eucharist is supposed to be the source and summit of that. Last night I was complaining to the Archbishop that at my church it's screaming singing every second. There's no reflection. There's no, there's not a second. It's like beat music. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, after communion, one beat music. Screaming singing all the way down the aisle, all the way back. The priest says, Mass has ended, screaming. <laughs> I, it, it's more like a bad performance by untalented music than it is the Eucharist. I know parishes differ on this. And I've spoken to my pastor many times. Finally, respecting preparation of the laity, I also suspect that in the future we're going to have to be more missionary. Priests, deacons, clergy, and laity are also going to have to go out more to find us. I'm not trying to put all the responsibility on the really just the most active clergy or laity, but I think it's news to no one that religion is no longer going to be transmitted in a family by osmosis. But rather, like Wordsworth, I love this, who doesn't, the world is too much with us late and soon, getting and spending and so forth. We need people to come out and say, hey, so every once in a while my best friend will say to me things like, hey, are you praying enough? You seem really to be falling off the wagon. Or, you know, I can tell that you're not at peace. Your prayer life must stink. You know, I lust what I want from my best friend. I want, my, I want my, my parish priest to say these things to me as well. Helen, you're worried too much about changing everything in the world. And I, you're just, you spend too much time worrying and not enough time praying. A few words in conclusion. Any church will tell you, any church, excuse me, any church historian, that the church has faced more than a few crises in her life. 
both in the ranks of the clergy and among the laity. And I was joking with um, Rosemary, who drove me here today, who is a church historian, that um, I keep a church historian around, my best friend, really mostly to remember, to sort of keep me on keel. She's a church historian in the US. Now is not the time to panic, excuse me, to panic or to bolt. It's the time to say as between clergy and religious and laity, what we say as between any twosome who is different but radically equal. We say as between a husband and a wife, and we should say here, there must be mutual subjection out of reverence for Christ. Thus transparency, thus honesty, thus mutual respect, but also thus accountability, thus pay your dues, thus acknowledge hypocrisy and wrongdoing, and make it right by all the standards that are right in humanity and as Christians. The need is urgent, as Christa Fidelis lay, she says, and no one can remain idle. The laity have to step up and assume their, their, their place in the world as a living witness to Christ. They have to put flesh on the teaching that life in Christ is a good life. <coughs> and we can affect other individuals and structures in the world. We have to offer our expert assistance to the clergy regarding internal matters, respecting everything from formation to finances to catechesis and others, to help clergy and religious bridge complicated or arcane Catholic teachings to a 21st century world that values equality, diversity, justice, truth, freedom, happiness. We also have to, to, to engage the clergy with our ongoing friendship. We really do have to be the people they can be honest with and, and be at the same level as friends. Uh, there's a, the, the, the pastor of my parish, it's just a great guy. He's a little, little younger than me. We've been friends for years. And, you know, he comes and tells me about such and such a woman who's flirting with him. He's, he's a really good looking priest. He's, I don't know if you have this expression over here. We used to call them as children, Father, what a waste. That was it. I don't know if you have that expression, but if not, I'm bringing it to you. But, Father, what a waste, you know. And, uh, terrible expression. Anyway, this priest is extraordinarily handsome. And um, this woman just was pestering him, and he said to me, like, I need this, and would you talk to her? Could you? Nothing I'm saying. And leave me alone and explain why, right? And of course, clergy themselves need to provide laity the formation that I spoke about, necessary for us to go out there and get it done. Our relationships must be close, warm, mutually respectful, at a time when it would be more than easy to take the low road just of suspicion and exclusion. So that's it. I want to thank you very much, and God bless all your work going forward. <laughs>